This video is brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com slash halocanon for a 30-day free trial and a free credit on an audiobook download. Stay tuned for more details. When the Halo novels first released, it only made sense that John 117 the Master Chief would be a primary focal point. He was the face of the franchise, after all. However, by the fourth novel, John was almost completely cut out of the expanded universe. I remember that when I got Ghost of Onyx back in 2006, I was kind of disappointed to find that Master Chief wasn't featured at all. Oh, how times have changed. The lack of chief focused stories has, in general, allowed Halo to grow much further than I think it would have if it had remained focused on him, and the games would of course continue that focus for the most part so we weren't exactly lacking in Master Chief content. When Halo Silent Storm was announced, I was more than a little trepidatious given the apparent chief-centric focus that 343 was and is going for. These anxieties are no secret to anyone who has followed me since it was announced alongside Collateral Damage months ago. But despite all this, I did at least have hope that it would be well written given the author Troy Denning was at the helm. Last Light was one of my favorite recent Halo novels and Retribution is damn good too. With Silent Storm, I'm happy to say that Mr. Denning has once again knocked it out of the park. Halo Silent Storm A Master Chief Story is an amazing addition to the fiction that picks up just months after the Spartans' first encounter with the Covenant and the loss of Sam-034. Troy Denning was not given an easy job with this story, having to tell a compelling narrative with a character that doesn't really allow for too much character growth due to pre-established fiction. However, Troy makes it all work. From here on out, spoilers ahead. If you haven't read Silent Storm and don't want to be spoiled, you can skip ahead to my spoiler-free wrap-up at the end. The time to skip to is on the screen now and in the description box. For anyone else, this is Halo Silent Storm. Our story opens on March 5th, 2526, on board the UNSC Prowler Starry Night over the world of Netherop. The Prowler is tracking a set of Covenant craft with the intent of trailing them and deploying Spartans to tail them to their mothership, a Covenant frigate. With any luck, they'll be able to capture it. Once orbits and velocities are matched, the Spartans of blue, green, and gold teams are deployed. The Spartans use their thruster packs, the same kind used during the mission to Kai City 4, not integrated thrusters I'm sure many are happy to know, to catch up with the Covenant craft, Banshees, and shadow them to the frigate's hangar. Once inside, the Spartans eliminate the hangar crew, composed mostly of jackals, grunts, and a drone, and the elite Banshee pilots. While brief, this section beautifully outlines just how little the UNSC knows about the Covenant at this stage. Like much of the book, it's a brief nuance that's difficult to convey in this summary, but suffice it to say Mr. Denning makes it well known just how much guesswork is going into this operation at its various stages. Once the hangar is clear, Gold Team sets to work loading the Banshees with Covenant bodies and tech, then pushes them out of the hangar door so that they can be recovered by the Prowlers at a later time. This would ensure the UNSC got something out of the mission should the capture of the frigate fail. Meanwhile, blue and green teams advance into the ship, blue team taking point, and green team securing any compartments at intersections along the way. As they advance, they make it through the tail section of the ship and eventually prepare to enter the ship's main body. As they do, voices from the Prowler crew break out on the Spartan's helmet speakers, someone having accidentally broadcast on Squadcom. The mistake is quickly realized, but happened nonetheless and may have compromised the Spartans. But, as Spartans do, they shake it off and continue with the mission. Blue Team enters the main body of the frigate, clearing out more elites and drones before making it to the bridge, or rather, where the bridge was estimated to be. Green Team entered soon after, heading below to secure engineering. Gold Team would bring up the rear and take out any additional resistance. As Blue Team moves forward, they find themselves trapped in a gravity lift, with alien fire and grenades raining down on them, and the gravity controls changing directions to make it difficult to respond. Eventually, Fred, Linda, and Kelly are trapped at the bottom of the lift, while John manages to make it to the top, where the bridge lay. He manages to get through the top hatch, only to find the elite shipmaster had activated a dead man self-destruct switch. John orders all his Spartans to evacuate and activate their beacons while he tries to secure the bridge. Unfortunately, John is ambushed by waiting drones and the shipmaster hand falls off the switch. John just barely manages to jump into and launch an escape pod as the ship self-destructs. 
Now for just the first three chapters, this book is full of amazing small details that I think most fans have either forgotten, were only implied rather than stated, or just flesh out exactly what the opening months and years of the Human Covenant War were really like. For example, you have John creating designations like Drone and Elite for two of the Covenant species for the sake of the operation, which go on to be the formal designations used by the UNSC. The Elite one is a little odd since John had previously encountered Elites on Alpha Core V2 in Collateral Damage, but it's not too big a deal. You also get a sense of just how many assumptions the UNSC has had to make when engaging the Covenant, a species whose entire idea of military tactics may be different from their own, or whose tracking and detection technology uses principles the UNSC might not even imagine. And then you get smaller details, such as the Mjolnir prototypes the Spartans are using, running on fission power, or John being something of a schoolyard bully prior to being a Spartan. Looking back at our brief glimpse of his civilian life, John was pretty rough with his fellow kids, so him being a bully kind of makes sense. But above all, I love the detailed descriptions of orbital mechanics and classic physics that go into the boring actions against the Covenant. It's a detail we really haven't seen much of, if we've seen it at all. It's one of those things that's usually just taken for granted. Seriously, the amount of detail in this book, and again, just in these first few chapters, is breathtaking and make it a worthy buy on their own. But we still have much to cover. Moving on, we jump forward to March 7th as, surprise, surprise, Staff Sergeant Avery Jr. Johnson has been called away from his assignment to the 11th Marine Force ODST Battalion at Neos Atlantis to the UNSC Valiant Class Cruiser Everest, the flagship of Admiral Preston J. Cole. Johnson is sent immediately from cryo to the command deck where he meets with Vice Admirals Preston Cole and Michael Stanforth along with the head of the Spartan II program, Dr. Catherine Halsey. As he enters, the group is arguing over strategy against the Covenant whether to abandon dozens of worlds to amass at strong points or try to defend every world they can. Eventually, Halsey brings the discussion back to trying to capture another Covenant ship, and at the moment, Johnson believes he knows why he's been summoned. As described in Contact Harvest, Johnson, just a year prior to this, had boarded a Covenant craft before the prolonged first battle at Harvest. It isn't long before the Three's attention turns to Johnson, and his purpose for being there is revealed. Between his combat experience against the Covenant and involvement with Orion, which is directly mentioned probably for the first time in a non-guide book, Johnson is the perfect candidate to help refine the Spartan twos. After being briefed on the Spartans, their recent missions, and told of the intent to attempt boarding action on a larger scale, Johnson is left with little choice but to accept his new assignment, in no small part because saying no to Oni just isn't a good idea. Pausing again, we need to briefly talk about Sergeant Johnson. Prior to this book, the first time we knew of Johnson and John 117 meeting was when the latter rescued the former aboard Gamma Station over Reach in Halo The Fall of Reach. They certainly didn't act like they knew each other, but granting this book the benefit of the doubt, there wasn't really much time for pleasantries, and their windows of interaction were quite limited, to say the least. So generally speaking, this isn't really a canon-breaking retcon, just a minor one. And that doesn't even go into whether the two actually end up seeing each other between Operation Silent Storm and the Fall of Reach. So, moving on. The next day, March 8th, on board the UNSC Point Blank class stealth cruiser, The Vanishing Point, Johnson, John, Halsey, Cole, Halima Ascot, and ODST Colonel Marmon Crowther meet to discuss their upcoming mission. Captain Halima Ascot will lead Task Force Yama, an all prowler force comprised of three squadrons of Eclipse and Razor class prowlers, each led by a Sahara class prowler. Colonel Crowther brought his 800-man ODST Battalion, the 21st Black Dagger Space Assault Battalion, which, while lacking direct Covenant experience, had been trained and equipped for zero-G operations and had stormed and seized 18 insurrectionist facilities ranging from low orbit to deep transit space zones. Together, the ODSTs, Prowlers, and Spartans would enact Operation Silent Storm, an effort to intercept a Covenant fleet, board as many capital ships as possible, and detonate small yield nukes inside them. Needless to say, Ascot and Crowther are shocked upon hearing this. After the shock wears off, Cold moves on, informing the group that the Covenant are currently glassing a backwater world called Edelon, and that another world, Biko, isn't too far from it. That is where Task Force Yama would have their best chance to strike. Battlegroup X-Ray, Cole's fleet, would draw attention to allow Yama to do what was needed, but after that, Yama would be on their own, doing what they could, when they could. We jump forward a bit as the Spartans and Black Daggers start training. Naturally, the Spartans win initially, but Sergeant Johnson starts leading the ODSTs, using non-conventional tactics, causing the Spartans to quickly lose their advantage. A few days in, Crowther announces his plans for shipboarding. 
12 platoons, each with a Spartan carrying the nukes, would deploy to hit 12 targets. This horrifies John as splitting the Spartans up would almost guarantee high casualties. John initially plans to hold off on challenging Crowther, but Johnson basically tricks him into doing it. Eventually, between John's concerns and Johnson's suggestions, they get Crowther to agree to three days of training using the current plan and seeing just how that works out. Meanwhile, we get our first cutaway from the UNSC as we find ourselves in the middle of a meeting to create a formal insurrectionist coalition. Held by former UNSC Marine Corps Major General Harper Garvin, this meeting is a smorgasbord of Easter egg appearances, such as Petra Zoyas, who we know from Last Light and works closely with the future GAO president Arlo Castile, Nancy Ander, daughter of Gerald Ander, who was assassinated by Sergeant Johnson in 2502, and Reza Limburg, also from Last Light and is part of the Venezian insurrection. But the piece de resistance is easily Lorraine Castilla, captain of the captured car and class frigate the Bellicose, and former wife of then Captain Preston J. Cole. If you've never read The Impossible Life, Impossible Death of Preston J. Cole, Lorraine and her ship were basically the rivals of Cole during the height of the insurrection at the turn of the 26th century. Eventually, unaware of her being his rival, Cole married Lorraine and even impregnated her. Before the baby was born, however, Lorraine's true identity was discovered by Oni, and she soon after faked her death. Since that story, it's been a bit of a mystery whether Lorraine was alive or not, though it's heavily implied she was. It's just awesome to see her confirmed to be alive and active. I do hope one day, though, that we might discover what happened to her and Cole's child, but I digress. The Innies are meeting to discuss the formation of a coalition, though former Marine Garvin finds he has trouble commanding the attention of anyone in the room. Luckily, Loren believes in Garvin's vision, which gets him some respect. The discussion quickly turns to the Covenant and whether or not it's real. At this point in the war, many insurrectionist groups think it's fake, for one reason or another, but Garvin assures them that the Covenant is a real threat. However, he believes that the Covenant are targeting all humanity because they don't know that not all humans are for the UNSC, and proposes a plan to try and ally with the Covenant. Again, early in the war, so you can't really blame the Innies for thinking this way. After much discussion, the group agrees to drip feed intelligence to the Covenant to try and form an alliance and see just how trustworthy the aliens are. And the first piece of intel they decide to drop, intel courtesy of Garvin's spy in Fleetcom, is about the Prowler ambush at Biko, during which they hope to eliminate the Spartans being deployed there. Joining back with John a few days later, the Spartans and Black Daggers are preparing for an exercise on Biko's moon of Sayoba. Unfortunately, they receive intel that the insurrection was planning to overthrow the Biko government using Sayoba as a base. So, Task Force Yama would have to take the moon first, then use it as intended against the Covenant. Before the mission starts, John is pulled aside by Lieutenant Commander Hector Nayedo, which should be a familiar name for anyone who's read Halo Retribution. Spoiler alert, but Hector Nayedo would go on to steal three Razor-class Prowlers when he defected from the UNSC. But for now, he appears loyal to the UNSC and puts himself in a position to act as John's only friend, the only one who truly believes in Spartan capabilities. The two talk for a couple minutes, Nayedo revealing he knows some details of the Spartans' true age and that it had been one of his men that had broken the Spartans' radio silence over Netherop. He apologizes, and John eventually accepts. Johnson soon comes in to remind them of the upcoming jump, and the two get ready. Minutes later, as the bay doors open and the first ODSTs drop, they find themselves immediately under fire, as if the Indies knew where Ghost Flight would be dropping. John goes to work, unclipping his rocket launcher and dropping into the fight, taking out any emplacements where he can. Blue Team Johnson and the Black Daggers soon follow. On the ground, ODSTs and Spartans meet up, and 1st Platoon Lieutenant Nellie Ham damn near chews John up for jumping like he did, out of position and without authorization. However, the company captain, Zelos Cuvier, soon shows up and compliments Ham on her initiative, stopping Ham shouting at John pretty quickly. The conversation soon shifts to next actions, which will involve Blue Team crawling up an iced acceleration tube of a mass driver, leading to a comm center atop it. Blue Team naturally accepts, John hoping it'll prove just how vital Spartans are. We once again cut away from the UNSC to, surprise surprise, the Covenant. Aboard the assault carrier Pius Rampage of the Fleet of Inexorable Obedience, we find Nazat Kavarosi glassing Edelon, what the Covenant call Igini, accompanied by the Minor Minister of Artifact Survey. As they are discussing how to speed along the destruction of Igini, a first blade of the Silent Shadow tells Zatulai, accompanied by Major Tam Lakosi, come aboard the bridge. 
Zatulai explains that while scouting the planet Amasa, or Alayoso, to the Covenant, a data pad was given to him by one of the humans and contained a message asking to work with the Covenant to destroy the UNSC. The First Blade, Fleetmaster, and San Shayum talk it over and ultimately decide to play along with the insurrection, for now. Pausing, this whole chapter serves as great insight into Covenant politics and perspective. We see how annoying the San Shayum can be to the Sangheili even this early on. We learn the Covenant names for several planets and sectors, and that both the Unrelenting and Radiant Arrow, these latter being the ship at Netherop, were both part of the fleet of inexorable obedience under Kavarosi's command. It's a great wealth of Covenant knowledge for a single chapter. Moving on, we once again join Blue Team on Sayoba as they work their way up the acceleration tube. After some trial and error, John, Fred, and Kelly start making their way up the tube, with Linda providing overwatch. About two-thirds of the way up, fire from an M41 Vulcan cuts off Blue Team's advance. Luckily, the person firing the Vulcan is an amateur, making it easy for Blue Team to slip past and even leave a fake target for the innies to destroy. Unfortunately, at the top of the accelerator tube, Blue Team learns that they were once again used as decoys, as Lieutenant Ham had been using them to draw any fire while the Black Daggers leapfrogged up the mountain and Hector Nayedo performed a Prowler drop. When John confronts Ham, she basically explains that she did this as revenge for John jumping out of the Prowler earlier. The story moves on as we come to the debrief for the operation at Sayoba. Discussion starts with John's taking of the initiative, which Crowther isn't too happy about. Over the course of discussion, Nayedo, seemingly accidentally, reveals the true age of the Spartans, much to the horror of those not in the know, notably Crowther and Ascot. Discussion moves on from there to why the Innies were at Sayoba at all. Both Johnson and John are able to figure it out, but Johnson forces John to say it, basically getting the rest of the room to see the values Spartans have. Old sergeants have a lot of tricks. As John explains it, the Innies were present and stayed to fight because they had been waiting for someone, just not the UNSC, leaving one alternative, the Covenant. The group is slow to accept this, but it becomes clear that it's the only possible explanation. And as if to confirm their suspicions, a Covenant flotilla of five corvettes is detected in system. Crowther, Ham, Ascot, and Nayedo scramble to get their forces ready, while Crowther puts John and the Spartans on prisoner escort duty as he's reluctant to put 15-year-olds into battle. On board the corvette Sacred Whisper, First Blade tells Zatulai notices human prowlers taking off from Sayoba, only barely seeing them as they depart and disappear. He's quick to interrogate a reader, a Sangheili who works at one of the Corvette's monitoring stations, and discovers that a small pocket of heat was detected on Sayoba, but was assumed to be a month-old impact of a comet or asteroid. But as interrogation continues, Zatulai realizes a horrifying truth. Human stealth craft are more stealthy than the Corvettes he commands, and he becomes determined to shoot one down. In a cave beneath Sayoba, John and the Spartans are loading the 300 insurrectionist prisoners recently captured. However, before they can finish, it comes over the radio that Task Force Yama Commander Ascot's Prowler, the Starry Knight, was shot down. Crowther and Nayedo scramble to find if any forces are close enough to get to the ship, and it quickly becomes apparent to John that he and the Spartans are the closest units, and the only ones able to get to the ship. John finishes loading the prisoners, then has the transport take off while he and the Spartans head for the downed Prowler. As they arrive, they find the Prowler split into two, one half wedged into the side of the icy mountain. John has the Spartans use the underslung grenade launchers on their MA-5B assault rifles to bring down the top half. While several Spartans are incapacitated, including John in the ensuing avalanche, enough are free to get into the ship, find survivors, and set a nuke to destroy the ship. As the Covenant start moving in to capture their quarry, John calls for help from the new de facto commander, Hector Nayedo. Hector says he'll be there soon and not to worry, but takes a long time to appear, leaving the Spartans fairly vulnerable. Eventually, Nayedo arrives, chasing off two of the Corvettes, but one remains to take the ship. John tells Linda to activate the 30-second countdown timer on the nuke she set, and for Fred to evacuate everyone in the ship via escape pod. John and the Spartans on the outside make a run for the minimum safe distance, a range much smaller than it would be on Earth due to Sayoba's low gravity and thin atmosphere. Just barely making it, the Spartans and recovered survivors of the Starry Night, including Sergeant Johnson, are safe, and the nuke detonated close enough to the Covenant Corvette to destroy it. On board the UNSC Vanishing Point, a funeral is held for those lost in the recent mission, and via internal monologue, we get confirmation that I think everyone likely saw coming. Nayedo is an innie, and he'd been trying to get the Spartans killed since Netherop, be it by giving away their position by broadcasting on an open comm or delaying the attack run over Sayoba. 
Following the funeral, Crowther meets with Sergeant Johnson and reveals that he's had reservations about Naito from the start. Johnson confirms that he had the same and questions whether Crowther still wants to keep the Spartans off the field. Crowther reveals he does not despite his reluctance about sending kids into the field and tells Johnson that he and the Spartans have a new mission to the recently glassed world of Adalon. Johnson soon finds Blue Team as they observe the opening invasion of Biko. The sergeant explains about NATO's treachery and Crowther's plan to send the Spartans to Adalon to put a stop to the Covenant Fleet's local logistics support. John is skeptical of Naito being a traitor as the man has been the only one to consistently support the Spartans, wanting instead for Crowther to be the one trying to get the Spartans killed. But if for no other reason than to test Crowther, John accepts the mission. Meanwhile, within the Covenant invasion fleet, First Blade tells Zatulai, accompanied by his Jeral Hanai guards, Castor and Orsoon, names you should also recognize from Last Light and Retribution, find themselves in the presence of the escaped insurrectionist prisoners, the ones the Spartans had been meant to guard, and the disappearance of whom had laid heavier suspicions at Naito's feet, as the pilot was one of his. Zatulai doesn't engage in dialogue with the Innies, but does accept their gifts, a nuke which had been intended to destroy a Covenant ship and a schematic for Mjolnir armor. Now, if you've read Last Light, Caster, by then a docab within the Keepers of the One Freedom, had said he'd acquired Mjolnir schematics during his time with the Covenant. Seems we now have that backstory. Anyway, we jump forward six days to Edelon, where the Spartans and Sergeant Johnson, supported by Dr. Halsey, are preparing to take out Covenant Munitions supply lines. A trio of air skimmers had been identified, the air being collected and used to manufacture plasma, and using the five captured Banshees they had, the fleet could be infiltrated and destroyed. Blue Team and Johnson deploy, but unfortunately EMP from nukes set off by Green and Gold Teams to destroy equipment carriers knocked out Blue Team's Banshees, along with most other Banshees in the area. John has Blue Team go EVA to finish the mission, with him, Fred and Kelly all targeting one of the air skimmers, while Linda and Johnson provide support with M99 Statch and Gauss rifles. During the mission, John insists that Fred and Kelly receive full cover at his expense, something Johnson doesn't allow. Basically, John has a hero complex at the moment as a result of Sam 034's sacrifice four months prior, aboard Unrelenting. Johnson gives John the best cover he can, but between more banshees and fire from the air skimmer, it becomes clear that John's only choices are to abandon the mission or detonate the nuke as he passes by the air collector. As he's about to pass, John lets the nuke float free and then reactivates his thrusters to put a little distance between him and the nuke as it detonates. In the days following the assault on Edelon, Halsey is able to deduce where the most likely Covenant Supply Depot is. She's able to do this thanks to a recovered Star Hollow from the Covenant Corvette downed at Sayoba, and the route taken by support vessels sent to Edelon in the wake of their attack. She also discovers that, in order for the Covenant to respond so quickly, they must have faster than light communications. Stuff like this right here is what really makes this book amazing. Showing the UNSC figuring out these pieces of information that we as fans just sort of accepted as fact for years. We've known of Covenant FTL communication capabilities, but we never really knew how or when the UNSC figured it out themselves. And now we do. Anyway, Halsey identifies the depot, a Covenant planet named Zoist, though she doesn't know that, which the UNSC names Naraka, after a place of torment in Hinduism and other primarily Indian religions. Initially, Task Force Yama jumps to a slipspace transit node, a place where one slipspace lane ends and another begins. Designated as Bhadra, after the Hindu goddess of the hunt in honor of Halima Ascot, the task force is gathered to prepare for their final jump to Naraka. Prior to the jump, John is pulled aside by Crowther and Johnson. As we learn of the plan to arrest Naito that the three had put together in secret over the last 14 days since Edelon, with the help of Dr. Halsey of course, Crowther presents John with a promotion to Master Chief Petty Officer. And while this can seem kind of forced, especially as it's basically there to justify John's rank two weeks later during the attack on Corbulo Academy as seen in Halo 4 Forward Unto Dawn, it's so seamlessly worked into the narrative that I barely noticed myself. John is promoted because Crowther wants to put him in charge of two Black Dagger companies, and the four rank jump from Crowther means that they'll see the Colonel has put his faith in John and that the Odious Tees should too. John. The Master Chief reluctantly accepts, but promises to live up to Crowther's expectations. The last thing the three discuss is what it means to be a leader. As we've seen, John is willing to put his life on the line for the mission, but that's not what a leader needs to do. A leader needs to be able to spend lives, as Mendez would have put it, to send people to their deaths and continue on with the mission. 
John considers the words from Crowther and Johnson and sees what they mean. He promises to change his leadership style accordingly. While Ghost Flight, led by Nayato and comprised of the Prowler's Ghost Song and a few others, jumps as scheduled, John has Lieutenant Esme Gite, Captain of the Black Widow, hold Sierra Force back, presenting her with a message from Colonel Crowther. The message reveals their intentions to relieve Nayato of command and gives a new slipspace vector. Gide contemplates this for a moment, but ultimately agrees to listen to Crowther and the Chief. Meanwhile, near Naraka, Crowther and Johnson are on Ghost Song's bridge, while Nayato is trying to find Sierra Force. This is the moment of truth. The plan calls for Ghost Flight to execute their tasks regardless of Sierra Force's presence. Nayato fails to do this and, worse, prepares a transmission which could give away their position. That is enough for Crowther to declare Nayato a traitor and relieve him of duty. Unfortunately, it seems the entire bridge crew were planted by Nayato, forcing Johnson, who was wearing full space assault gear, to retreat from the bridge while Crowther is killed. Johnson encounters more traitors as he moves through the ship and tries to warn the Black Daggers on Ghost Song. He soon learns that it's too late and that the majority of Captain Ham's platoon was blown into space, only she and four other ODSTs remaining aboard. Luckily, the platoon had already sealed their space assault armor so they could be recovered later if the Prowler was taken. The remaining ODSTs and Johnson attempt to do so, but thanks to hidden security cameras, their attempt is foiled and they're also blown into space. Meanwhile, Sierra Force finally arrives, only to find the spaced ODST platoon, Sergeant Johnson broadcasting in the open, and three prowlers moving away from Naraka. Covenant ships are moving towards Johnson, though John and Gite soon figure out that Johnson is just trying to get Naito killed, using the Covenant to do so. Much as it pains him, John has to continue on with the mission. Before moving into position, the Black Widow detects three Tau Bursts, a type of particle detected when slipspace jumps are made. The three are coming from the Ghost Song and two other Prowlers with crews loyal to Naito. But once again, John and Sierra Force have to focus on the mission. As the Black Widow moves towards Naraka, nukes placed by another Prowler at the planet's Libration Point outposts go off. Afterwards, the plan was for Sierra Force, four teams of Black Daggers led by Spartan teams, to hit the orbital ring facilities over Naraka and cut off the Covenant logistics support in this sector. Unfortunately, the orbital rings are heavily guarded. As we were informed in an earlier chapter, Telzatulai figured out that the humans had discovered Zoist's location and the fleet of inexorable obedience was redirected to the planet for defense. John obviously doesn't know all this, but figures at least that the Covenant had figured out their plans. Luckily, he notices gravity lifts from the planet to the rings, so Sierra Force can invade from below and go up the lifts. It's risky, but it's the only plan they have. Blue Team and the 32 ODSTs of 3rd Platoon, led by Lieutenant Smallbear, make it to Naraka's surface just barely with some support fire from Black Widow. Unfortunately, the two prowlers carrying Gold Team and 1st and 2nd Platoon's Delta, Widowmaker and Quiet Death, had been forced to abandon their insertion run. The Quiet Man, which carried Green Team, had broken up during insertion, but Green Team and many of its ODSTs had landed on Naraka. Though they had no way of contacting the team, John was confident that their leader, Kurt 051, would find a way. Blue Team and its ODSTs push forward to the Gravlift. They lose one man, Private Chavez, but manage to clear out the area and leave a small nuke on a 40 minute timer behind as they ascend to the ring station above. An interesting thing we learn about during this section is something called the shot. It's a powerful narcotic used by ODST medics to relieve pain and anxiety in a dying trooper. A lethal dose is administered to Chavez, as his condition is too grave to survive in the field. It's one of those darker details that at one time maybe some of us might have thought about, but here the realities of battle and field medicine are given a bright light. It's a brief but powerful moment. Moving on, on board the Pious Rampage, Tel Zatulai is summoned to the bridge much to his annoyance. There he finds the minor Minister of Artifact Survey still going on about the attack at Zoist being a diversion, while High Charity was under attack, and Fleet Master Nizat Kavarosi, who is now questioning his decision to come to Zoist. When Zatulai is informed of the surface incursion and the attacks near the grav lifts, he immediately figures out the human plan. Invade via, as the Covenant call them, Skylifts. He informs the Fleet Master and Minister as he prepares to leave to confront the Spartans, when the Minister suggests simply reversing the lifts. Both Sangheili are taken aback, as returning the humans to the service of a holy forerunner planet like Zoist is a blasphemy neither can tolerate. And here we can see a critical flaw of the Covenant play out as it has in other media, their zealotry. I'm sure without me saying so that you would figure the Spartans will win the day, thanks in no small part to this decision right here. 
We join back with Blue Team and Third Platoon far up the lift with four minutes left to nuclear detonation, and based on his Mjolnir's calculations, they would make it into the Terminus with only 22 seconds left to get clear of the nuke's shockwave. John as everyone prepares the nukes in Okta, a shaped non-nuclear high-yield explosive. As they get closer to the entrance to the station, John sees that the debris and bodies from their initial attack on the graph lift below had not been cleared. He sends Fred and Kelly ahead with some ODST support. Inside the Terminus, Fred and Kelly encounter heavy resistance, and both John and Small Bear realize they're about to encounter heavy casualties. The Spartans and ODSTs do what they can, but ultimately only Blue Team and six members of 3rd Platoon survive, not including Small Bear who had been sucked out of the Terminus during the decompression that followed the nuke shockwave, which had traveled all the way up the gravity lift. With little choice, the group carries on, having to hit 10 facilities along the ring to ensure the mission was a success. Using Covenant transport sleds, Blue Team clears the way while ODST survivors plant Okta and nukes to destroy facilities along the support ring. By the sixth facility, however, the ODSTs find themselves trapped and go out with their Okta. John is distraught, but he holds that at bay while searching for a way to finish the mission. Peering outside, he finds three other facilities destroyed on the opposite side of the ring, meaning Green Team is alive and operating. He also spots what we can definitely tell is a CSO supercarrier being constructed, as it's noted as being well over 20 kilometers long. He also spots four Banshees likely sent to stop Blue Team. John figures that the team can destroy the vessel, then escape via the Banshees. Blue Team continues their assault, eventually finding themselves at the space docks where the CSO is being constructed, and, having identified four Banshees in the CSO hangar, shoot and kick their way out of the transit tube and space jump to the hangar. Meanwhile, Zatulai comes across the havoc the Spartans left in their wake. Talking with Kigyar Crewman, he soon realizes that the Spartans have infiltrated the CSO, the Hammer of Faith, and heads for it himself. Inside the hangar, Fred and Linda clear out enemies, while John and Kelly run away into the ship to set off their remaining nukes. Unfortunately, they finally meet Tel Zatulai and his silent shadow. Zatulai puts up a strong fight, hitting John in the shoulder and damn near taking his head off, but the Spartan teamwork and Mjolnir ultimately win the fight. With only a minute to spare, Blue Team evacs, John patching his armor on the way out, and make it away just in time. They make contact with Task Force Yama and are scooped up by the Night Watch. The book comes to a close with a couple of epilogues. Fleet Master Nizat Kavarosi is berated by the Minor Minister of Artifact Survey for the umpteenth time, pushing Nizat's steward, Tam Lakosi, over the edge, killing the Prophet. Nizat says they'll mark him as a casualty of the fight and orders Lakosi never to speak of it. They finish up their meeting talking about a number of captured ODSTs, who only seem to laugh when interrogated by the Covenant Mind Melters. On board the Night Watch, John and Johnson bond over Sweet William's cigars, while they watch the Covenant Logistics Station, the Ring of Mighty Abundance, continue to be destroyed either by its own debris or time-delayed explosions. As the book ends, John resolves to take Crowther's lessons to heart, making sure to honor his legacy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Halo Silent Storm, a Master Chief story. God, what a book. As I indicated at the start, I could never have imagined such a brilliant story for a character that seems so devoid of character development until Halo 4. But Troy Denning did it. He managed to flesh out the Chief as a character without stepping into Halo 4's territory, telling a story of a literal boy becoming not just a man, not just a leader, but a commander and understanding all that that entails. But even more than that, Denning is able to balance dedicating time to other members of Blue Team making them feel like real, present characters. And on top of this, the book is filled to the brim with easter eggs and references either to Denning's other works or to other works within the canon. It's incredibly gratifying to see some familiar reference or character every few chapters only to be bombarded with them all of a sudden. And the fact that they don't feel forced but flow naturally as part of the story is a true testament to Denning's ability as a writer. When Halo Last Light first came out, many, myself included, praised it as a strong return to the more military sci-fi tone that had dominated Halo's earliest novels, notably those written by Eric Nyland, while Denning is still able to make his own writing style stand out. It's a beautiful work of literature that any Halo fan should pick up if they haven't already. However, it isn't just the UNSC and humans that Mr. Denning masters, but the Covenant too. Their perspective is brief in relation to the rest of the book, but they are very well characterized. Familiar elements combined with new information and insights only guessed at previously to make them both a real threat and realistically fallible. If I had much in the way of real criticism, it's that the story just ends too soon. 
I want to see more of John's early years, to see more of the Spartan twos at work. But even more than that, I'd love to see Denning dive into the Covenant perspective more as he clearly has a solid understanding of them. So rating time. It's been several months since Silent Storm came out and I've had plenty of time to reread and consider it. But there's no way around this. Halo Silent Storm gets a 10 out of 10 in my book, a rating I've only previously given to The Fall of Reach and Silentium. It's a damn good book in every respect and I sincerely hope you get yourself a copy if you haven't already. It's worth every penny. So, those are my thoughts, but what are yours? Let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching, thanks for waiting, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this, be sure to check out Audible. By going to audibletrial.com slash halocanon, you can get a 30-day free trial and a free audiobook. Audible's selection is unmatched and includes all the Halo novels. You can cancel at any time and keep any audiobooks you've purchased. So check out audibletrial.com slash halocanon today.